started a study series, however you want to call it, entitled Leading People to Christ. And for those of you who were here last week, you had the opportunity to hear my personal testimony. And I shared it with you because it, to me, really helps to explain why this series is so important to me. And I also used it to give you a glimpse of perhaps someone you may know who shares the same plight that I once had. Now, unfortunately, there are people who go to churches all over our country who have never been exposed to Romans 10, 9, and 10. They've never been told that they should even ask Jesus to become their personal Lord and Savior. Now, many go to church every week, and they consider themselves devout Christians, just as I did, without ever learning the salvation message. Now, last week, we also talked about the sense of urgency that we must have when it comes to sharing the good news of Jesus with others. We can't put it off until tomorrow, because what, quite, quite frankly, and we discussed this too, that tomorrow really may be too late. Now, tonight, I want us to deal with and dispel some of the many reasons Christians are hesitant to share the gospel. Now, I'm doing this this way because as I said, and as I shared with you before, I used to do this as a class, and I used to do it in a classroom setting, and for those who took the class, they can tell you, they took tests, they had quizzes, it was school, okay? I'm trying not to do it so much so that way, this go round. I'm really trying to do it more, I don't want to say conversational, but more in a way that we really dig deep and deal with the issues because my goal still remains the same. I want everybody to be comfortable with being able to share the salvation message with anybody, not just your family and your friends, but I want you to be able to stand on the line at the market or Starbucks and be comfortable with doing it. And one of the big things, and I've learned this through doing the classes a few times and just in talking to people in general, that the big elephant in the room, if you will, is the fact that people are hesitant and there's a reason. So that's what we're gonna deal with tonight because I wanna kind of put that to bed. And I wanna do that because if we do, then you can receive all of the other information. Whereas if we don't talk about it, it's just hanging there like a little cloud and you're half hearing what we're talking about because you're still thinking about the fact, I don't know, you know, you have all of that. So we're going to deal with all that, get that out of the way, so then everybody can just receive. Amen? Yeah. Okay, great. So that's why we're talking about it first. So what, if I were to ask you, let's do it that way. If I were to ask you, are you comfortable speaking to anyone, whether you know them or not, about salvation, how would you answer? Now, some of you might be quite confident and comfortable. Most of you may not. In fact, if you truly are being authentic, some of you may even be wrestling with fear. Now, we know that fear is false evidence appearing real, but sharing the salvation message, when you think about it, is really very simple. But since it is so simple, why does it make Christians uncomfortable? The answer is also simple, wrong thinking. Most times we get trapped into a cycle of thinking filled with what if. I'll give you some examples. What if I don't have what it takes? What if I'm uncomfortable talking to people? I don't like talking to strangers. I'm shy. What if, and this is a good one, they might ask a question that I don't know the answer to. What if I'm concerned about what people think about me? What if they might reject me? 
And that's really a big one for a lot of people, especially if you're dealing with family or friends or people you know. It's already hard enough to be rejected by someone you don't know, but someone you do, you, you don't want that to happen. What if I'm not sure of the right scriptures to use? I don't even know necessarily where to find them. What if that happens? Wrong thinking can go on and on. We could do this all night with wrong thinking. What I want us to do instead is turn with me to 1 Corinthians, the second chapter. And we're going to knock all of these negative thoughts right out of our minds. And we are going to break this thing down. I'm going to read it to you out of the Amplified. And as we read this chapter, you're going to find that the Apostle Paul, who wrote the chapter, would have understood any of these negative thoughts that I just mentioned. More importantly, he shows us how to overcome them, and he shows us that we all have the mind of Christ. So let me know when you're at 1 Corinthians, the second chapter, praise the Lord. As I said, I'm going to read it out of the Amplified. So let's start. And when I came to you, brothers and sisters, proclaiming to you the testimony of God concerning salvation through Christ, I did not come with superiority of speech or of wisdom, no lofty words of eloquence or of philosophy as a Greek orator might do, but I made the decision to know nothing, that is to forego philosophical or theological discussions regarding inconsequential things and opinions while among you except Jesus Christ and he crucified and the meaning of his redemptive <laughs> substitutionary death and his resurrection. I came to you in a state of weakness and fear and great trembling. Now, does that not sound like he can understand any of those things that I mentioned before? He would understand exactly what we're talking about, right? Okay. Verse 4. And my message and my preaching were not in persuasive words of wisdom, using clever rhetoric, but they were delivered in demonstration of the Holy Spirit operating through me and of his power stirring the minds of the listeners and persuading them so that your faith would not rest on the wisdom and rhetoric of men, but on the power of God. Yet, we do speak wisdom among those spiritually mature believers who have teachable hearts and a greater understanding, but it is a higher wisdom, not the wisdom of this present age, nor of the rulers and leaders of this age who are passing away. Now, verses five and six, what I want us to see is that this shows us that there's a distinct difference between the wisdom of man and the mind of Christ. There's a difference, and that's what that just let us know. Now, let's read verse seven. But we speak God's wisdom in a mystery. The wisdom once hidden for man, but now revealed to us by God. That wisdom, which God predestined before the ages to our glory, to lift us into the glory of his presence. That's letting us know that, of course, God's wisdom, once it was hidden, but now, for us, it has been revealed. Verse 8, none of the rulers of this age recognized and understood this wisdom, for if they had, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. But just as it is written in Scripture, things which the eyes which the eye has not seen and the ear has not heard, and which have not entered the heart of man. All that God has prepared for those who love him, who hold him in affectionate reverence, who obey him, and who gratefully recognize the benefits that he has bestowed. For God has unveiled them and revealed them to us through the Holy Spirit. For the Spirit searches all things diligently, even sounding and measuring the profound depths of God, the divine counsels and things far beyond human understanding. For what person knows the thoughts and motives of a man except the man's spirit within him? 
So also, no one knows the thoughts of God except the Spirit of God. Now we have received not the Spirit of the world, but the Holy Spirit who is from God, so that we may know and understand the wonderful things freely given to us by God. Verses 10 through 12 have just let us know that it is the Spirit of God that gives us the mind of Christ. Verse 13, we also speak of these things not in words taught or supplied by human wisdom, but in those taught by the Spirit, combining and interpreting spiritual thoughts with spiritual words for those being guided by the Holy Spirit. But the natural, unbelieving man does not accept the things, the teachings and revelations of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness, absurd and illogical to him. And he is incapable of understanding them because they are spiritually discerned and appreciated. And he is unqualified to judge spiritual matters. In other words, the mind of Christ cannot be understood by those who do not have the Holy Spirit. You must have the Holy Spirit or otherwise it's not going to mean anything to you. Verse 15, but the spiritual man, the spiritually mature Christian judges all things, questions, examines, and applies what the Holy Spirit reveals, yet is himself judged by no one. The unbeliever cannot judge and understand the believer's spiritual nature. And what that's letting us know, quite frankly, is as believers, we receive discernment in spiritual matters as we operate in the mind of Christ. But notice, it's as we operate in the mind of Christ. Verse 16, for who has known the mind and purposes of the Lord so as to instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ to be guided by his thoughts and purposes. Think about it. Having the mind of Christ enables us to do what? It enables us to share the plan, the purpose, and perspective of Christ. I'll say that again. Having the mind of Christ enables us to share the plan, the purpose, and the perspective of Christ. Now, all believers possess this ability since he resides within us. And we have been hearing about this and being taught so wonderfully by Minister Scott with his series on dependence within dependence. The point is, we're learning all about that over and over. Well, turn with me to Luke's Gospel. And we're going to look at the 19th chapter, verse 10. Luke 19, verse 10. And we all know this because the New King James Version, everybody pretty much knows this by heart for it says, for the Son of Man has come to do what? To seek and save that which was lost. The message says pretty much the same thing. So, I mean, it just says it a little bit differently. He came to find and restore the lost. It's still the same. So we know that Jesus came to seek and save the lost. Turn with me now to Matthew's Gospel, the ninth chapter. And we're going to look at verses 36 through 38. Let me know when you're there. Okay. And the New King James Version says, But when he saw the multitudes, this is Jesus, he was moved with compassion for them, because they were weary and scattered like sheep having no shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, The harvest truly is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore pray the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. I like the Message Bible a little bit. I'm not going to say, well, better actually. And it says, then Je Jesus made a circuit of all the towns and villages, which means he went all over the place, okay? He taught in their meeting places, reported kingdom news, and healed their diseased bodies, healed their bruised and hurt lives. When he looked out over the crowds, his heart broke. I really like that because it explains, again, the characteristic of Jesus. So confused and aimless they were, like sheep with no shepherd. What a huge harvest 
he said to his disciples, how few workers on your knees and pray for harvest hands. Again, this is letting us see that Jesus was compassionate. So we've already established that we operate with the mind of Christ. So we should want to seek and save the lost. We are also filled with God's wisdom. So what does that mean? We should be compassionate. Now let's also, this I kind of really like, so this is why I'm gonna share it. Ephesians 4, turn with me there. And I want you to just see verse 30. And I'm gonna read it to you. I'll read it to you. We see it in the New King James Version. Ephesians 4, verse 30. And it says, And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. We get that? That's good. I like the message. That's what I want you to hear. For it says, Don't grieve God. Don't break his heart. His Holy Spirit moving and breathing in you is the most intimate part of your life, making you fit for himself. Don't take such a gift for granted. And I submit to you that we do have a tendency to do just that. And we know that we don't ever, ever want to grieve the Holy Spirit. So should you still have some concerns, as you may, turn with me to 2 Corinthians, and we're going to look at chapter 3, verse 6. And let me know when you're there. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 6. Okay. The New King James Version says, who also made us sufficient as ministers of the new covenant, not of the letter, but of the spirit. For the letter kills, but the spirit gives life. And this spirit that they're talking about here is the Holy Spirit. If we look at it in the Amplified Bible, classic edition, it says, it is he who has qualified us and I see, this is again why we read different translations, because it breaks down what does that mean. This is what it says. Who has qualified us, making us to be fit and worthy and sufficient. That to me is a little bit better than just saying we're sufficient, okay? As ministers and dispensers of a new covenant of salvation through Christ, not ministers of the letter, of legally written code, but of the spirit. For the code of the law kills, but the Holy Spirit makes alive. I'd also, because I really apologize, I should have done this earlier, I welcome any of you who are viewing us from Periscope. We're blessed to have you with us and we look forward to you coming and being here physically with us in our corporate office sometime. We're located right here at 470. 7th Avenue in Midtown Manhattan, we would love to see you sometime. But in the interim, we're very blessed to have you with us here. Uh, so after reading that, we have to think about the fact that so often Christians have no idea of the tremendous ability God has placed in them. And that, when you really are authentic and think about it, is true. We don't really think about that because this three-dimensional world in which we live trains us to do what? Think about what we can do. And we think about that all the time. When you're in the midst of a storm, usually you first think about what you are going to do about it. How are you going to fix it? And it's because you've been trained that way from birth to think that way. So don't beat yourself up, but just understand that you've got to adjust that because that's what you are, you know, you think about it. If you have bills that come in, you start thinking, okay, how am I going to get the money to pay this bill? You know, I mean, that's, it's, and if none of you have felt this way, I'd be very surprised. I'm being honest and telling you I know I have, okay? Where you start to sit and think, how are you going to figure it out? What are you going to do? Even if you are going to the doctor and the doctor gives you a diagnosis that is not, you know, a good one, it's not a good report, 
you automatically start looking to yourself. Well, what can I do? You know, I need to change this or change that. Now, don't misunderstand me. I am not trying to say we're just supposed to sit and be little robots and just say, okay, Lord, um, I'm being attacked in my physical body, so I'll, I'm going to just press this button here, and then all of a sudden I'm just going to receive the manifestation of my healing. Or I have a mountain full of bills, and I'm going to press this other button over here, and the sky's going to open up, and the money's just going to fall in my hand. No, I'm not being ridiculous. But what I am saying is we have to recognize that we can't just look to ourselves to fix it. Yes, we are supposed to put feet to our faith, okay, so that we are doing something, but we've got to trust him. You've got to be all in with what it is that he has promised, for the word that he has promised is the only truth that you truly have. Because anything a doctor tells you is not the truth. What the word of God says is the truth. Your mountain of bills is not the truth. What the word says that he promised to meet all of your need according to his riches and glory. He didn't say anything about your own. So we have to stop thinking just about ourselves. And that applies even when it comes to ministering salvation to somebody else. Get yourself out of the way. Because to be quite frank, it's not about you. You didn't save anybody. You didn't even save yourself. So stop being so caught up in you and put your focus on him. So you may not feel like you have what it takes to share the gospel, but God has already provided you with all that you need. He knows that you can do it. And more importantly, he's chosen you to do it. So the very day that you were born again, God gave you what you needed to lead people to Christ. He literally did. He deposited it into you. And I'll prove it to you. Let's look at Romans, the eighth chapter. And we're going to look at verse 11. Romans 8, 11. And looking at the New King James Version, it says, but if the spirit of him who raised Jesus and him in this instance, they're talking about God, but if the spirit of him or God who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. Now, if we look at it in the Amplified classic edition, it says, and if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, then he who raised up Christ Jesus from the dead will also restore to life your mortal, short-lived, perishable bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. And if you just want a real short and simple version, look at the contemporary English version. And it says, yet God raised Jesus to life. God's spirit now lives in you, and he will raise you to life by his spirit. Let's look at 1 Corinthians, the sixth chapter. And we're going to read verses 19 and 20. 1 Corinthians 6. And we're going to read verses 19 and 20. Okay. You have it? Yes. Praise God. All right. So out of the New King James Version, it says, Or do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God, and you are not your own? For you were bought at a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. The Amplified Classic Edition says, Do you not know? that your body is the temple, the very sanctuary of the Holy Spirit who lives within you, whom you have received as a gift from God. You are not your own. You were bought with a price, purchased with the preciousness and paid for, made his own. So then honor God and bring glory to him in your body. The Living Bible translation, which the acronym is TLB, says, haven't you yet learned that your body is the home of the Holy Spirit God gave you? 
and that he lives within you? Your own body does not belong to you, for God has bought you with a great price. So use every part of your body to give glory back to God because he owns it. Then I want us to look at Colossians. We're going to look at Colossians, the first chapter, and we're going to read verses 15 through 19. Now, what I'm hoping you're getting to see, I'm really hoping you're getting it here, is that all through all these scriptures we're seeing, we operate with the mind of Christ, we have God all through us, okay? He is in us. So let's just be logical, even if you will. If God is within us and we operate with the minds of Christ, then when it comes to ministering to someone else, what are we even thinking about it for? Why do we even have a moment of concern, a moment of thinking, a moment of trepidation, a moment of thinking that we can't do it? We don't have to do it. God is within us. Amen. I stand before you now. I'm opening up my mouth. I'm not doing this. I'm not relying on me. The moment I had to think for one second that I had to rely on me, I wouldn't be up here. I promise you that. Because it's funny. People see me oftentimes and they have no clue that I'm actually very shy. Right. Everybody usually chuckles. They laugh. Nobody would believe it. I am shy. I am the type of person. I would just assume, sit over there in the corner, back over there by the ladies' room where you don't even know I'm there, okay? Or over here somewhere. I am not a person who likes to be all, that's not me. But I don't, I, if I had to do it, I'd be petrified. But I don't even, I don't think about it. I don't think about it for a second. I just stand here, and that's why you hear me in every prayer. I make myself available to be used by you to meet the needs of your people. And that's what I believe with my whole heart. I just stand here and open my mouth. So if it comes out and it sounds crazy, okay, Lord, <laughs> that's on you. It has nothing to do with me. And that's what we have to do even when we're ministering to somebody. Stop putting the pressure on you. Because here's what you really have to think about. You don't have the ability to save anybody. Because you, quite frankly, as wonderful and beautiful and dynamite and erudite as you think you are, you did not stretch your arms and die for one person. So since you did not do that, you don't have that. But you can make yourself available because you don't want, and when, sometimes I think we don't always think about it when it comes to strangers. But you think about people in your family do you want to see them? Do you want to be with them forever? Or do you want them to spend time in the lake of fire? Do you want them to go to hell? Do you really? If you don't, why not share with them the gospel? What are you afraid of? I mean, it hurts me when I think of people. And one of the things that I will intercede for <laughs> until I can no longer speak is when I think of mothers who have children and their children are not saved. Because I cannot even imagine what that's got to feel like to have a child and you don't know where they're, you, well, if they haven't received Jesus, you do know where they're going to spend eternity. But the fact that they're not going to spend eternity with you and they're not going to spend eternity worshiping the Father, that is painful to me. I intercede for mothers all the time with that, okay? It's so much better when we know where they're going to be, you know? So that's just on that level. But you, I'm sure you know of people. I'm sure you have people that you are close to, that you want to know that you know that you know, that they are going to spend eternity with the Lord. And if you don't say something, and their tomorrow comes before you have said something, how are you going to feel? So I don't want that to happen to any of us. That's why we're doing this. <laughs> and that's why you're here. So it doesn't have to happen. Praise the Lord. So Colossians 1, we're looking at verses 15 through 19. Now what I'm going to do here is I'm going to read it to you out of the Living Bible. 
You follow along with whatever translation you have, and then I'm going to read it to you out of the contemporary English version because it breaks it down very, very well. So starting with verse 15 out of the Living Bible, it says, Christ is the exact likeness of the unseen God. He existed before God made anything at all. And in fact, Christ himself is the creator who made everything in heaven and earth, the things we can see and the things we can't. The spirit world with its kings and kingdoms, its rulers and authorities, all were made by Christ for his own use and glory. He was before all else began, and it is his power that holds everything together. He is the head of the body, made up of his people, that is, his church, which he began. And he is the leader of all those who arise from the dead, so that he is first in everything. For God wanted all of himself to be in his son. Now the contemporary English version says it like this. Christ is exactly like God, who cannot be seen. He is the firstborn son, superior to all creation. Everything was created by him, everything in heaven and on earth. Everything seen and unseen, including all forces and powers and all rulers and authorities. All things were created by God's son and everything was made for him. God's son was before all else and by him everything is held together. He is the head of his body, which is the church. He is the very beginning, the first to be raised from death so that he would be above all others. God himself was pleased to live fully in his son. Now you may not realize it, but the same spirit that anointed Jesus to preach the gospel has anointed you to do the same. Turn with me to Luke's gospel, the fourth chapter. And we're going to look at verses 18 and 19. We're going to look at it in the New King James Version first. And you're there? OK. This is Luke 4. Starting with verse 18, it says, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. Now, I'm going to read it to you out of the Amplified, just the traditional Amplified. And it says, the spirit of the Lord is upon me, the Messiah, because he has anointed me to preach the good news to the poor. He has sent me to announce release, pardon, forgiveness to the captives, and recovery of sight to the blind, to set free those who are oppressed, downtrodden, bruised, crushed by tragedy, to proclaim the favorable year of the Lord, the day when salvation and the favor of God abound greatly. Now, we also have the ability that Jesus had as well. And that we can find based upon what's written in 2 Corinthians, the third chapter. So turn with me there, please. 2 Corinthians, the third chapter. And we're going to look at verses 5 and six. Now, if we look at it in the New King James Version, eh, it's okay. <laughs> I'm not really in love with this translation of it, but it's okay. So we're going to read it. And it says, as a matter of fact, let's read it together. Make sure we're all on the same page and keep all of you awake and catch your sleep. Okay. Uh, are you ready? <laughs> ready, read. Not that we are sufficient of ourselves to think of anything as being from ourselves, but our sufficiency is from God, who also made us sufficient as ministers of the new covenant, not of the letter, but of the spirit, for the letter kills, but the spirit gives life. 
good. Okay. Now, if we look at this out of the Amplified Bible Classic Edition, it breaks it down where we really understand. Because this keeps saying sufficient, sufficiency, and that's good. But this makes it ultimately clear. Starting with verse 5, it says, Not that we are fit, qualified, and sufficient in ability of ourselves to form personal judgments or to claim or count anything as coming from us. But our power and ability and sufficiency are from God. So we cannot get it twisted thinking it has something to do with us. It has everything to do with God in us. Verse 6, it is he who has qualified us. Now we're going to break down what does qualify mean. Making us to be fit and worthy and sufficient as ministers and dispensers of a new covenant of salvation through Christ. Not ministers of the letter of legally written code, but of the spirit. For the code of the law kills, but the Holy Spirit makes alive. Now, I like the word dispenser. Because whenever you think about that word with anything, whether it's a candy dispenser or a cup dispenser, it's something that's giving you something, right? Everybody can relate to that, okay? So we are to be dispensers of what? Of a new covenant of salvation through Christ. So this is letting us know this is what we're supposed to do. It's not really an option. It's kind of like this goes along with you being an ambassador for Christ. Okay. So the easy to read is really short and simple, and it says, I don't mean that we are able to do anything good ourselves. It is God who makes us able to do all that we do. See, I kind of like that, because for those who think that they're so smart and that they have achieved whatever it is that they have achieved in their life, they may have worked hard for it, and I think that's a wonderful thing, but I like this because I like what it says. You didn't do any of it when you really think about it. You were only able to do it because of God in you. He made us able to be servants of a new agreement from himself to his people. It is not an agreement of written laws, but it is of the spirit. The written law brings death, but the spirit gives life. I really, 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 really like that. So with what we have said so far, I like to just use the acronym KISS. Keep it simple, saints. Just keep all of this simple. Don't, don't have it all stressed out in your mind. So when you focus on your own natural abilities, it can create a challenge because you're going to do one of two things. You're either going to lack confidence in yourself, causing you to rarely, if ever share the gospel with others. And if you do, you're going to do it in a timid, nervous, almost scary manner, which is not really all that effective. Or you're going to be one of these people who is very confident in your own abilities. And this is really dangerous because you will share the gospel trusting in your capabilities instead of his. In other words, you allow your ego to get in the way. And we all know that the acronym for ego is edging God out. In other words, you are so, you know, you think you got it all together that you don't need to listen to the Holy Spirit. You're going to do it. And you'll find that, yeah, you could do that. And you may share, you know, the, the word. But it's not usually something that's very lasting for the person that you shared it with. So therefore, it didn't really work well. So it's not the way to go. Rather, what we should do is we should have the attitude like Jesus. Let's look at John's Gospel, the fifth chapter. And we're going to look at two verses of scripture there. We're going to look at verse 19. And then I'm going to have you drop down to verse 30. So let's start with verse 19. This is John's Gospel, the fifth chapter, verse 19. And we're going to start with the New King James Version. And verse 19 says, are you there? Yes. Then Jesus answered and said to them, most assuredly, I say to you, the son can do nothing of himself. Now, Jesus even says he can't 
can't do anything of himself. So who are we to walk around and act like we got it all together and we can do it? Oh my goodness. Okay. <laughs> um, but what he sees the father do. He can do nothing of himself, but what he sees the father do. For whatever he does, the son also does in like manner. Now, if we look at that same verse out of the Amplified Bible Classic Edition, it says, so Jesus answered them by saying, I assure you, most solemnly I tell you, the son is able to do nothing of himself, of his own accord, but he is able to do only what he sees the father doing, for whatever the father does is what the son does in the same way, in his turn. Now, if we drop down to verse 30 in that same chapter, Again, he just reinforces it because this is Jesus speaking and he says, I can of myself do nothing. As I hear, I judge and my judgment is righteous because I do not seek my own will, but the will of the Father who sent me. And if we look at it in the Amplified Bible Classic Edition, it says, I am able to do nothing from myself independently of my own accord, but only as I am taught by God and as I get his orders. Even as I hear, I judge, I decide as I am bidden to decide, as the voices come to me, so I give a decision. And my judgment is right, just righteous, because I do not seek or consult my own will, I have no desire to do what is pleasing to myself, my own aim, my own purpose, but only the will and pleasure of the Father who sent me. Now, can you imagine if we just did that? I mean, it, oh, probably if we could just take 24 hours and just do that instead of doing what we think. Boy, so it is paramount that you remember to look to God and trust that his ability will work through you. Exercise your faith. Put your confidence, rather than putting it in yourself, put it in his faithfulness. When you do that, he is able to bring results beyond what you will ever know. Now your job is simply to plant and water the gospel wherever you go and leave the harvest up to him. See, that's the thing that many Christians get caught up with too, but I understand it. So I'm not knocking you. And when I bring up these things, please know I'm not knocking you. I get it. Because we are, again, taught a reward system. You know, when you go to school, you make A's, you get on honor roll. How come they don't give honor roll to a child who's getting D's? Now, now and I'm not being funny. The child getting D's may be working just as hard as the child who's getting A's. Maybe his ability level is really that of a D. It may not be an A, but because of the way in which things are set up, you're rewarded if you get an A. You're rewarded if you see the end result and it's high. If the bar is high and you reach it, you're rewarded for that. So if we as Christians are ministering to someone, we want to see the harvest because that means we did well. We again didn't do a thing. We didn't stretch our arms and die, so we did not do it. But that's what we look for and look to because that's what this three-dimensional realm has taught us to do. And what I am saying to you is stop doing that. Plant and water. Your job may be to just plant the seed in the ground where you see nothing. Okay, think about gardening. Go back to, you know, how they used to teach us in primary school. <laughs> you know, you take the little seeds and you put them in the ground. And, you, you know, if you're in first and second grade, you go back every day because you're thinking the plant's going to be there. And it's nothing there. It's just the ground. Okay, and you keep watering it and watering it. And you get so excited when you see the first little shoot of something come up. Okay, well, we're supposed to plant and water and leave the harvest to God. And if you do that, you find you take a lot of pressure off of yourself, too, because then you don't feel like you failed or you didn't do it right or you did something wrong. So that's important. Now, if you think I'm just kind of like making that up, turn with me to 1 Corinthians, the third chapter, and we're going to look at verses 6 and 7. 
I'm going to read it to you first out of the New King James Version. And it says, I planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. So then neither he who plants in anything nor he who waters, but God who gives the increase. And if we look at it out of the easy to read, it says, I planted the seed and Apollos watered it, but God is the one who made the seed grow. So the one who plants is not important and the one who waters is not important. Only God is important because he is the one who makes things grow. Amen. So you will find that your abilities mean very little if you truly believe that God brings the results. So whenever your thoughts hinder you from sharing the gospel, and let me tell you this, and you all who've been here for a while, you already know this. Since we're discussing this, you can bet your bottom dollar that the enemy is going to come at you with every kind of thought, idea, and suggestion about why you do not need to share the gospel. You can count on it, okay? That's his job. But we have to remember, we've been given authority over all of his ability. We've got to understand that. So when those little thoughts start to try to creep back up, because like I said, they may, and you'll be thinking things, because these are the suggestions he normally gives, I'm quiet or shy. I could definitely relate to that, OK? Or I'm nervous. I'm really kind of afraid. And we know we don't have the spirit of fear, but let's be authentic. We're afraid, OK? Um, yeah. I don't know enough. That's a good one. He always comes up with that. I don't know enough. And what if they reject me? OK. Now, if you are entertaining any kind of thought that's negative like that, I'm going to tell you what you're doing. You're really being self-centered because you really are just thinking about yourself and what you think and what you is you 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 okay now when you're focused on the Lord your thoughts encourage you to share the gospel and you think things like God is not quiet or shy which is why I'm standing up here with my mouth open because he certainly seems to know how to talk through me okay God is not afraid so why should I be? I mean, we're supposed to be bold and strong. God certainly knows enough. I mean, his wisdom is infinite. So he obviously knows. And God is truly able. We know that just from all the things that he does for us. So God can do this through me. All I have to do is make myself available to be used by him. And <laughs> when you think about the fact that who you are is not important. Who God is in you is very important. Your ability doesn't mean much. God's ability in you means everything. You have the privilege when you stop to think about it. Anytime you want to share the gospel with anybody, you have the privilege to work together with the most high God. Amen. I mean, you need to stop and think about that, okay? You have the privilege to do that. How many people can say that? Unbelievers can't even relate. That doesn't even apply to them. But you have the ability to work together with the most high God. I mean, if that doesn't get you somewhat like, I can do this, um, I'll pray for you, okay? Now, there's one reason why God chooses to use you. One reason. Again, this is very simple. We try to make everything so complicated. Why is the one reason that he would choose to use you? Because you're willing. You're making yourself available. You're willing. God is not looking for people who are great, who are outgoing, <laughs> okay, I'm not, who are charismatic, who are glib, who are dynamic. Who, he's not looking for all that. He is looking for any person who is willing to allow him to work through them. Let's look at 2 Chronicles, the 16th chapter. And we're going to look at verse 9. 2 Chronicles, the 16th chapter, verse 9. 
and let me know when you're there. Okay. Second Chronicles 16, verse 9. The New King James Version says, For the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth to show himself strong on behalf of those whose heart is loyal to him. In this you have done foolishly. Therefore, from now on, you shall have wars. Now, I'm going to read it to you. Okay, I'll do it this way. Uh, the Living Bible says, for the eyes of the Lord search back and forth across the whole earth, looking for people whose hearts are perfect toward him so that he can show his great power in helping them. What a fool you have been. From now on, you shall have wars. Now, I'm going to read it out of the expanded. And as I shared with you, um, might have been last week. I don't know. Could have been Tuesday, whenever. The reason I like the expanded version. Am I out of time? <laughs> Oh, I am so, okay, now this wasn't, okay, I'm out of time. <laughs> so when we come back, we'll read it out the expanded version. Okay, the expanded version, and you can read this on your own before we come back. Okay, my clock wasn't up, so don't, don't throw stones at me. Uh, but anyway, the expanded version, the acronym is E, X is in X-ray, B is in boy. And I will say this to you, I can share this a little bit. The reason why I have started delving into the expanded version is because it's extremely literal. It breaks every single word down. So there are some things that other translations kind of gloss over and miss, this does not. And I like what it was gonna do with that little translation, but we'll come back to it uh, next week. Thanks for joining us. Our hope is that you received something that you can apply to your life and strengthen your faith. At Crenshaw Christian Center, New York, we believe that the Word of God is practical for everyday application. If you'd like to support the ministry with your tithe and offering, you can mail them to Crenshaw Christian Center, New York, 450 7th Avenue, Suite 2111, New York, New York, 10123. We now offer the convenience of text and online giving, one of the most secure ways to give. Try it now. Simply text East G from your smartphone to 28950 and follow the prompts. You can even specify a designation for your gift. Text East G for general donation, East T for type, or East O for offering. Each transaction needs to be its own individual text message. You can also visit our website, FrenchRChristianCenterEast.org, and click the Give tab to begin your experience. Set up recurring donations or give one-time gifts. This experience is easy to use, secure, and requires a one-time registration only. Giving the second time is even easier. Simply text EASTG to 28950 with all your information securely stored. We appreciate your continued support and stand in agreement with you for the manifold return in your life. Thanks again for watching. And remember, we walk by faith, not by sight. We would like you, our viewers and partners, to join us in honoring the legacy of the Apostle by making a donation to the Apostle Frederick K. C. Price Library. The library will be on the grounds of the Faith Dome in Los Angeles, California, and it will be open to the public. It will be a place of study, learning, and research, available for anyone desiring to further their knowledge and understanding of the Christian faith. Visitors will also have a chance to learn more about our founder and his impact on the body of Christ and the world at large. You can mail your donations to Crenshaw Christian Center, New York, 450 7th Avenue, Suite 2111, New York, New York, 10123. If you are giving by check, be sure to designate in the memo area, Apostles Library. If you have Crenshaw Christian Center envelopes, you can mark AL on the envelope. You can also donate via your smartphone by texting EAST AL to 28950 and follow the prompts. We thank you in advance for your support. And as always, we stand in agreement for the manifold return in your life.